All right, guys. So uh, this is part two of chapter 10, uh, which is in a rotational motion. But this one is going to be on rotational dynamics. So part one was rotational kinematics, which basically described how the object is rotating. So we learn about the rigid object and you know how it's rotating, what type of measurements we can do for the um, being able to measure displacement or angular velocity or uh, angular acceleration and how those variables related to the linear velocity acceleration and displacement. And in this chapter, in this part, right, or in the second part of this chapter, we're going to learn about rotational dynamics, which in a way, you know, asking us why or answering the why is the rigid object is rotating. So imagine like that you have a wrench and that we can use to loosen, let's say, some you know, natural bolts, right? And the question here is, what do we do to make it rotate? And um, so this is what, you know, going to be, you know, uh, We'll be learning in the next, you know, four or five slides, which is basically the um, concepts behind making the ro rigid object rotate, which in a way is similar to the Newtonian, you know, linear dynamics, right? So why the object is, let's say, changing its motion, why the object is accelerating. And we learned, let's say that you need to apply force and object starts, you know, speeding up or slowing down and those different type of things, right? So in this case, pretty much the same. So imagine you have a wrench and, you know, let's say you might have um, I don't know, some kind of uh, not a bolt somewhere over here. So what do we do to make it rotate? Well, the obvious question will be, all right, so you apply force. So, all right, so I, I apply force, but, you know, let's say, what if I apply force right here? Will this be enough to make it rotate? Well, obviously not. Well, how about I apply force, you know, further from that point, right? Remember, this is technically going to be the axis of rotation because we will be rotating with respect to that. So, well, how about somewhere else? So, you know, basically somewhere further from that, you know, point. Well, how about I rotate somewhere over here or apply force somewhere over there? Will this rotate? Well, obviously not. So you can see, right, applying force is one logical, let's say, uh, reasoning in order to for us to rotate the system, but it's not the end of the story. So applying force, you know, is obviously one of the re, you know one of the things that we need to do, but also how and you know where we apply the force. So obviously, for example, if I apply force somewhere over here, this will be relatively you know uh, successful in rotating, right? While if I apply force somewhere right here. Well, that's probably going to be, so let's call this F1, F2, F3, and F4. Well, this is going to be then probably even more effective in rotating the wrench, right? Um, and as you can see, right, so that means, you know, one thing we have here is for us to be able to rotate the wrench, we need to apply force. But here's F1 is, you know, basically not going to rotate it. F2 is not going to rotate it. And um, F3 and F4 will rotate it. But you know, one is more effective than the other one. In this case, F4 is more effective. And the reason because of the distance from the, let's say, wrench, right? So let's say the axis of rotation of the wrench, which let's say, let's call this L3. And let's call this, let's say L4, right? The distance where the force is applying. And in a way, what we have here is our ability to rotate depends on our applied force, how far away that force is. See, for example, this point four, right? I have two forces, F4 and F2, but F2 is not effective and F4 is effective. That means orientation of the force is also very important. But in any case, so at least right now we have two very, you know, important, let's say parameters that we, you know, uh, figured out, which is applying force <clears throat> and applying force further from the axis of rotation and possibly such that this force, as you can see, right, is not directed some kind of, you know, toward this axis of rotation. See, this one is, you know, exactly at the axis of rotations. This one is pointing toward that. And um, those two are ineffective. So we're going to see that that's, you know, very good reason for, you know, why those two are ineffective. In any case, so thing like this, then F4 is at this point, the most effective at the rotating. And you can see, right, more or less, you have something like this, right? In order to rotate, you apply some kind of force. And that force has to be some, you know, finite L distance from that. 
And it also should be such that the force is not pointing you know, toward the axis of rotation. That's also gonna be important. Either the entire force or the component of that should be such that it is perpendicular to this you know, line L because that's basically the distance, right? Or the, you know, vector R from the axis of rotation to the force. And that's basically one of the important factors in order for us to be able to rotate. All right, so now when you apply force, so you can, right? So here's the wrench, right? So here's the axis of rotation O, let's put it in a you know, coordinate system. So let's say we decided to apply force at some point uh, P, right? Uh, which has a distance r from the from the axis of rotation of the wrench, and what we have here is then let's say this is my this is my force and the direction, and the force, right? This force will be effective in rotating, and when you have a, when you apply force and it rotates the system, then we can say that this force exerts torque, and the torque, which is given with Greek tau, is then there's the tendency of a force to rotate an object about some axis, okay? So that means we apply force, and if the force is rotating, then we can say it exerts torque, okay? It is the cause of the changes in rotational motion and it's analogous to force. You can say that why is the you know rigid object rotating? Because there is some kind of force exerting a torque. Without a torque, rigid object will not rotate. Or one thing we will see without a net torque. Remember, we learned that if you have an object that is at rest, you know, there are a number of forces acting on it. And if they cancel each other, you know, the net force is zero. Object is not, you know, moving, right? Not accelerating. So that net force is zero. And in a way, what we have here is this. The net torque is what required to make the object, you know, rotate. All right. So as we learned, right, the, our ability to rotate the system depends on the applied force. That means this torque is proportional to the applied force, to the magnitude of the applied force. Also, how far away it is makes a difference. Further it is technically, you know, more effective it is. So torque is also proportional to the distance r. Okay. And also orientation, because one of the things we can see is that if I take this applied force F and if I break it down into its components, right? See, here's a component which is the X component of the force. And here's the Y component of the force. So one of the things we have here is one component is actually not effective at all. The other component is effective. And always the one that is effective is perpendicular component, is the perpendicular component to this you know, vector R. And vector R is the vector from our axis of rotation to the point of interest where the force is applied. So then I can say that this is, here's one vector R and then here's another vector F. And then I also need to know the angle theta between them, angle theta between them, because it will allow me to break it down into two components. And you can see, right, if I break it down to two components, this is F perpendicular to that R, F perpendicular, which is F sine theta. And this is the one that actually effective in the rotating, right? So. If I pull you know, in that direction, right, on the wrench, I'm never gonna rotate it. So that means what I have here, more or less, I have then the perpendicular component of the you know, force that is perpendicular to the, you know, this uh, vector R, right, that actually effective. Anyway, so putting everything together, then we have this equation where torque equals R times F times sine of the phi, phi is the angle. All right, and this is then, what we call torque. So the torque is calculated by taking the force, magnitude of the force, the distance, and then sine of angle phi, which is the angle that force makes with the, uh, let's say with R. For example, if the force is in this direction, then you're taking this angle phi. Okay, if the force is that direction, that means the, the, the angle where, you know, the force directly, you know, uh, makes with uh, this, you can say that this radial line, this radial line. All right, so the units are, you know, meters times newtons or newtons times meters, and that's the units for torque. Okay, so if you, <clears throat> uh, if you let's say good with your units and keep track of the units that you use for the quantities that we've been studying so far, you should recognize newtons times meters. 
we have already had a quantity with the same units, newtons times meters. And that was the work done, which was force times delta x, right? Cosine of theta. Remember, this was newtons times meters also. But remember, the work done was then a dot product, right? Dot product between, you know, those two vectors, f dot delta r. Uh, and the units are newtons times meters. But this is completely different quantity because the work done was a scalar. And the torque is a different quantity because it's a four, it's a vector, which is, you know, we're going to see it's technically, it, it's also a product of two vectors, but it's, you know, you can see the difference here is this, the, the work, done, work done is FR cosine theta, torque is RF or FR, doesn't really matter, right? Uh, you know, uh, sine of phi. So the, this is this in terms of sine, this is in terms of cosine, and it makes a big, you know, big difference, right? Makes a big difference because we end up with completely different product. This is, we're going to see, right? When we multiply R and F, to get the torque, we need to use a cross product or a vector product where we, when you, you multiply force and uh, R to get the work, we have to use a dot product, which is a scalar product. And the cross product actually, uh, you know, obviously much more, you know, difficult, you know, uh, mathematical operation. In any case, so what we have here is we can call like this, <clears throat> there's this quantity D, which we use to call moment R at the moment R and is the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to a line drawn along the direction of the force. That means in a way we can also use that, but think like this. So how do we know, for example, if the force is effective in rotating? The easiest way to do here is this. So you take the force and you draw a line, which we call a line of action of the force. So this is the line of action of the force. If then you're able to draw a non-zero D from the axis of rotation to that you know, line of action, that means this force is effective. That means this line of action, <clears throat> excuse me, the line of action does not go through the axis of rotation. So that's why, for example, if I go back to this previous example, let's look at F1. Why was F1 is, you know, not effective? Because see if I do a line of action for F1, F1 goes to the axis of rotation. So why was F2 ineffective? Well, F2 was ineffective because if I draw a line of action for F2, it also goes to the axis of rotation. F3 doesn't, so there is this, you know, D, right? And F4 doesn't, and there's also this D. So that means, you know, those two vectors, F2 and F1, if you do the line of actions, they go through the axis of rotation. And any force whose line of action going through the axis of rotation does not exert torque. So it's easiest way to kind of remember in terms of when you're given an object, like a rigid object with multiple forces acting on it, which one actually gives you torque, draw the line of action and see if it's going through the axis of rotation or not. All right, so if two or more forces are acting on a rigid object, each has a tendency to produce a rotation about the pivot at O, you know, which is the origin, right? The axis of rotation. If the turning tendency of the force is counterclockwise, the torque will be positive. If the turning tendency of is clockwise, the torque will be negative. All right, so let's let's kind of look at that you know range that we had, right? So let's say this was the range, and it's kind of rotating something. So let's see what it means by you know by this statement. So think like this. So I want to let's say rotate. So then I have one force here acting F1, but then I have another force acting like this F2. So. This will be then R1, this will be then R2, which is, you know, from the axis of rotation, right? To that, um, you know, let's say point one and point two where the forces are acting. Now to get the torque <clears throat> for each one, then I can say, all right, so torque one is then R1 times F1 times sine of phi. And I can see, right, if this is, if I'm drawing the line like this, so then F1 is perpendicular to that line. So here is phi is 90 degrees. And, you know, torque two is then R2, F1, sine of phi. And here's also phi is 90 degrees because this is also perpendicular to that line. That means if I'm doing the net torque, this is then torque one as vectors, right? Plus torque two. But one of them has to be negative. One of them has to be positive because, you know, for example, this is a, a you know a vector right a vector sum 
Well, here's what I do. So look at F1. If F1 is acting, it's gonna make it rotate in this direction, which is clockwise. If F2 is acting, F2 is gonna make it rotate in that direction, which is counterclockwise. That means the one that is, you know, counterclockwise, we say that the torque is positive. The you know, the turn if the turning tendency is clockwise, we say it's negative. That means negative torque one plus torque two will give you net torque. Okay. And you can see, right? So in this particular case, the F1 will have, you know, will try to rotate it clockwise, F2 rotate it counterclockwise. And whichever gives you not the strongest force, but the strongest torque will win. So let's say if I calculate this and I get negative two Newton's times meters, which means this guy here is, you know, a stronger torque. That means the system gonna overall start rotating counterclockwise, okay? So torque depends on the force and where the force is applied, okay? And I can even have it like this. I can match the forces and positions such that let's say if I, you know, even though F1 is acting further, I can increase the F2 and I can cancel them, right? So I can cancel the, the, the forces and there is no torque. The system is not rotating. All right, so let's look at this example. So this example basically uh, gives you, you know, pretty much, you know, application of the previous statement. You have two thin disc shaped wheels of right A, RA equals 30 centimeters and RB equals 50 centimeters are attached to each other on an axle that passes uh, through the center of each as shown. Calculate the net torque on this compound wheel due to the two forces shown, each of magnitude 50 Newtons. All right, so what I can do here, I can see that FA is acting RA distance from the axis of rotation, all right? And our, you know, force FB is acting, you know, radius RB distance away from that. So then I can say, all right, so the net torque is equals to, uh, you know, torque one plus torque two. All right, so what is then torque one? Torque, well, let's do this, FA and FB. So torque A is FA times RA, then times sine of phi, but I can see that there's, this is, you know, or let me do it like this, sine of phi A. Then I need to see, is it positive or negative? Well, the tendency of force A is to rotate this counterclockwise, so it is positive. Then I have, you know, torque B. So I have then FB, RB, sine of phi of B. Now, is it positive or negative? Well, I can see that this is gonna make it, you know, clockwise contribution, so it is negative. That means what I get here is this. So FA is 50 Newtons. The RA is given as 0.3 centimeters. So 0.3 meters. Then sine of 90 degrees. Then minus FB here is 50 Newtons times 0.5 meters. So it's acting further, right? But you know, one of the things we can see here is it's, it's at an angle. So now the question here is which angle should I use? 30 or 60? Well, remember you have to take the theta. So this is that radial line, right? This is that radial line for the force B and the theta from the force to that radial line is the angle that you need. So it's sine of 60, okay? And if I calculate, I'm gonna get negative 6.7 Newtons times meters or meters times Newtons doesn't really matter, okay? So, and this means it's negative, which means net torque is negative. So the disc is gonna rotate uh, clockwise, All right? That means there's gonna be clockwise, not, not rotation, but it's gonna start speeding up in that particular direction. All right, then. so um, as I mentioned, the torque is a product of those two vectors, which is basically um, position and force, right? Or the, or the uh, position vector and force as a vector. Uh, again, so if you, if you are looking at uh, the same example that I have, wrench, which is, you know, uh, a pretty, pretty good example of, you know, system that is rotating. So think like this. So let's say this is this axis of rotation 
And let's say this is, let me put like X axis, this is Y axis. And so let's say there was a, a force like this acting in this direction. Here's the force trying to rotate. So that's a, that's, the, that's a vector, right? Force is a vector. And then what I would do, I will draw another, you know, vector like this, right? From, um, let me try to make it straight. So like that. So this is then my R as a vector, okay? And torque is product of those two vectors. And yes, you have an angle phi that you can you know, measure between them. And here's the thing, if you have the magnitude of the force and you have the magnitude of R, which is just basically how far away the force is, you can just say, all right, so it's just, just R times F times sine of that angle phi. And that's it. Because product of those two vectors that gives you a vector is, can also be written in terms of R F sine of phi, they're equivalent. But, this is basically what we call a cross product or a vector product. Because if you take two vectors, F and R, and multiply them together, you can get two things. So force and R, thing like this. So if you do a dot product, which is a scalar product, we get the work done, as I mentioned. Uh, but if you do the vector product to get a vector as an answer, then you need to do a cross product, and this gives you the torque, okay? And that's what we have. So we need to do a cross product and it's a little bit more complicated because remember work done is a scalar means that all you get is some kind of number. So let's say some 20 Newtons times meters, which was later, you know, converted into joules, right? Or, you know, turned into joules because, you know, 20 joules is same as 20 Newtons times meters if you're calculating the work done, but it didn't have any direction. Work done was a scalar with no direction. Torque has a direction. And when I'm calculating this, I'm not calculating technically direction of the torque. Even though, as I mentioned, right? So you can say that, all right, torque is counterclockwise, torque is clockwise. That's not quite accurate. Torque is not counterclockwise or clockwise. We can use counterclockwise or clockwise tendency of a force to get the torque as positive or negative, but the force, uh, the torque itself is actually always gonna be, you know, out of the page or into the page in this particular case. So think like this, if this is my plane, right? If this is my plane, the torque will be always out of the page or into the page. Think like if this was the wrench, like this, right? See if that's the force acting. So this is, this you can see, right? This is X, Y plane. And look at where the torque is. Torque is out of the plane, out of the plane. That's because when you're doing the cross product, your resultant, right? The, the you know, whatever you're calculating, will be perpendicular to the plane where the other two forces, you know, are. That means R and F are in an XY plane. So the torque will be on a, you know, along the Z axis, which is basically, you know, out of the page. So this is Z axis, okay? So that's what, what, what we'll have for the torque. Now, so that's why it's a little bit more complicated to find it and also even to calculate it because we have to, you know, um, do two things. First, we have to calculate, let's say RF sine phi, and then we have to use what we call a right hand rule to get the direction of the of the of the force of the sorry of the torque of the resultant but it's something that you know not necessarily that difficult to do once you get you know comfortable with it once you practice a little bit that thing like this so let's say you have two two vectors a and b and you're doing the cross product okay so a cross b well, well, the magnitude of the vector, which is the resultant vector, right? In this case, let's call this C, which is a, you, when you do a cross product of A cross B, you're doing, you're getting, you know, vector C. We can find the magnitude by simply multiplying the magnitude of A and B, and then the sine of angle, sine of theta between them. Anything like this. If you give them vector A's and B's and you have the theta between them, between them, then it's just AB sine theta, no problem but then also the direction. What is the direction of the C? In this case, you use here, we can see right, the right hand rule, using your right hand. So one of the things you can do here is this, you start with your, let's say fingers pointing in the direction of the first vector, which is vector A. And then you curl your fingers in the direction of vector B, you, like you see in the picture, right? So thing like this. So this, was, this, is, this is your, you know, you start with this, right? So let's say these are your, you know, your, your hand like this, right? Where your fingers pointing in the direction of vector, uh, vector A, 
And then if you curl in the direction of vector B, right? If you start curling direct vector B, which is in a way right now, if you do it, it will be toward you. Then your thumb gives you the direction of vector C, which will be this guy over here. So you can so I try to do it right now. So your, vec your fingers in the direction of vector A, which is more or less toward your monitor, right? And then you curl toward vector B, which is kind of toward you. And then your thumb should be basically pointing perpendicular to kind of this, this plane of A and B, right? So perpendicular to that, which is basically more or less pointing upward. And that's how you find direction of this resultant vector C. So that's why, so the direction can be given with the right hand rule, okay? So that's why, for example, if I go back here and let's say I'm using this X, Y plane. So let's say I'm using this, this, this example over here. So let's try to do that. If I'm trying to do this right now, my hand, right, I'm using right hand. I need to make sure that my fingers in the direction of the uh, vector R. So that, that's why this one's sort of like my fingers in the direction of vector R. But such that I should be able to curl my fingers toward the direction of the force, okay? So, and the force is basically, you know, let's say should be curling in that direction, okay? That means if I have my fingers and I start curling them, my thumb should be pointing out of the page. So if you do that right hand, so first you need to more or less have your fingers pointing in the direction of uh, vector R. And then your palm should be basically more or less facing the direction of vector F. So when you're curling, you can curl in the direction of vector F and if you do it correct right now, your thumb should be pointing toward you. So basically out of the page. Okay, that means this will be the direction of this, you know, torque, which is out of the page. All right. So we'll, we'll practice this, you know, you practice, you will practice this in class as well. All right, so, but also you can do some mathematics, you know, some basically some liberal of algebra, right? So with, with uh, cross product. And important thing is that it's not cumulative. It's not commutative. So A dot B was equals to B dot A. If you're doing that product, that product A dot B equals B dot A. A cross B is not equals to B cross A. Because if I go back and look at other way around, if I do F cross R, you know, or in this case, for example, if I do the, you know, other way around, which is instead of A cross B, I do B cross A, which is first my fingers pointing toward B, which should be more or less toward yourself, right? And then you curl toward A, which is curling toward the monitor. Then your thumb will be pointing down instead of pointing up when it was before. That's why there's this negative between them. So if A is parallel to B also, where theta equals zero or theta equals 180, then A cross B equals zero. Because remember, if you do A, B sine of theta, if theta is zero or 180, sine of zero, 180 is zero. So the cross product is zero. So that's why A cross B equals zero, uh, basically is uh, two parallel vectors. Then their cross product is zero. Also, if you do A cross A, you get zero because you know you have two vectors, you know, uh, both, of, both of them have the same magnitude, same direction. That means they're parallel. Again, A angle theta between them is zero. So then you get zero cross product. So only you know, when they are, you know, uh, they have a non-zero non data and data which is also not equals to 180 degrees. That means they're not parallel or anti-parallel. Anything else you get some kind of, you know, a cross product. The maximum, the amount of, you know, the, the resultant that you get is when they are perpendicular exactly. Then A cross B is equal to just AB since sine of theta is equals to one if, you know, those two vectors are perpendicular. Also A cross B equals B plus C so A cross B plus C quantity, right? Then you can combine A cross A cross B plus A cross C. So you can also have something like that. Also derivative with respect to T, if you're doing derivative of the cross product, then it becomes DAT cross B plus A cross DB DT, okay? So that means you're taking derivative of the first one then cross product with the second one, then the second one cross product of the derivative of the second one. So kind of like that. Also, here's the important thing to know is that if you're doing, as I said, right, if you do A cross A, you get zero. But if you do A cross B and A, and B, A and B are perpendicular, right, so you get basically AB. And this is important because what we have here is when you talk about unit vectors, 
That means what if your vector A and B, you're not given in terms of its magnitude, but let's say you're given A X A hat plus A Y J hat and that, 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 right? Same with B vector, B X I hat plus B Y J hat. So you're given in terms of their components. How do you do the cross product for those? Well, in that case, you have to use the, you know, unit vectors, but this can help you to kind of, you know, use those as well. Because if you're doing the cross product between I hat cross I hat, J hat cross J hat or K hat cross K hat, you get zero. Again, zero because I hat vector is parallel to the I another I hat vector. So the cross product is zero. But then if you're doing I hat cross J hat, so things like this. So if this is your, um, you know, let's say unit vector I hat, remember, which is pointing in this direction. And then second one is unit vector J hat, which is in that direction. See, let's try to do this together right now. So take your, you know, right hand. So your fingers now should be pointing toward the positive X axis, that's I hat. And you should be able to then, you know, have your, you know, let's say palm right now facing upward, which is in the direction of the second vector. That means your palm should be pointing toward the positive Y direction because you need to curl your fingers towards J hat, right? So think like this, if, you, if you're using your right hand, your fingers in the direction of I hat, then you curl in the direction of J hat, see your thumb is pointing in the direction of K hat, which is then out of the page, right? You can see, right? That's what you have. I hat cross J hat should give you K hat because of that, you know, right hand rule can tell you that, you know, perpendicular two vectors, right? I hat J hat, but if you use them, you get, you know, K hat. But if you go other way around, for example, if you start with J hat, so like, let's say, what is J hat? Sorry. Uh, what is uh, J hat cross I hat? Well, that means your fingers now pointing up in a positive Y direction. Your palm is facing positive X direction because then you have to curl toward the positive X direction. So if your fingers right now in a positive J direction and you curl in the direction of positive I hat direction, then your thumb is pointing in a negative K hat direction. So that's what you should have. Okay. All right. So anyway, so this one's, you know, you can practice a little bit using your right hand rule and verify all of those that, you know, J hat cross K hat is I hat, negative K hat cross J hat is also I hat and, you know, all of those things. So the signs are interchangeable. For example, I hat cross negative J hat is basically the same as negative I hat cross J hat. Because, you know, as long as they are perpendicular, that negative can be, you know, moved from one to another, doesn't matter. So answer is still negative K hat for both of them. So let's look at then this example over here. You have two vectors lying in the X, Y plane are given by the equation A equals two I hat plus three J hat and B equals negative I hat plus two J hat. And we need to find A cross B and verify that A cross B equals B, negative B cross A. All right, so now I'm gonna give you two ways of solving for this. First one is kind of what I just show, you know, showed you. Let's say we do A cross B. So for this one, here's what I do. Okay, so this will be two I hat plus three J hat cross negative I hat plus two J hat. And just basically do just a little bit of algebra. So which becomes, you know, uh, this with, you know, two I hat times negative I hat, you know, then two I hat times negative uh, two J hat and things like that. So that, that's kind of what we do. So this becomes two times negative one, then I hat cross I hat, right? So when you, when I do the first one, then plus two times two, then I hat cross J hat. Then plus three times negative one, J hat cross I hat. Then plus three times two, J hat cross J hat. Now from here, I can right away, remember what we had in the previous slide and say this. I hat cross I hat or J hat cross J hat, they're all goes to zero. So that means this entire thing is zero. 
this entire thing is zero. Those two terms do survive because you are doing cross product between two perpendicular unit vectors. Okay, so let's say what we get. So two times two is four, but then I hat cross J hat. So the question is that what is I hat cross J hat? Well, if you do that, again, as I say, right, your fingers in the direction of the first vector, which is I hat, then you curl in the direction of the second vector, which is J hat. So you should get then out of the page, um, a pointing, thumb pointing out of the page, which is K hat. And then you have plus three times negative one, so minus three, and then you get J hat cross I hat. Well, J hat cross I hat is then actually negative K hat, which is also showed you in the previous class, previous slide, which then gives you, you know, this negative makes becomes four K hat plus three K hat, negative, negative cancel, right? And then you get seven K hat. So that's the answer for that. All right, so how about if I do B cross A? Well, if I do B cross A, this becomes negative I hat plus two J hat cross two I hat plus three J hat. So then this becomes, you know, same thing, right? Negative one times two, then I hat cross I hat plus negative one times um, three, then, um, sorry, I had cross J hat, then plus two times two J hat cross I hat, then plus two times three J hat cross J hat. Again, from here, I can see that this is zero, I hat cross I hat, and this is zero, J hat cross J hat. And then from here, I can say that, all right, so then this term survives, which is negative three, then I hat cross J hat. So that gives me, you know, K hat. Right. And then plus two times two, is a four and then J hat cross A hat gives me then negative K hat. So then this becomes negative K hat minus four K hat. So negative seven K hat, which you can see, right? Is exactly opposite of that. So that's why A cross B is equals to negative of B cross A. All right, so as I, as I mentioned, I'm gonna show you a different way of also doing this. And this is using the matrices. So you can say A cross B is, can be written like this. So you do a three, three by three for this particular one, because remember, so what we have is this, you have I hat, J hat, and K hat. So now vector A is this. So vector A is two, three, and zero two for I hat, three for J hat, and zero for K hat. Vector B is then negative one, two, and zero. Okay, so something like that. All right, so, um, well, let, let me do this for a second. We'll come back to that. So let me do it like this. So let's say this is AX, AY, AZ, BX, BY, and BZ, something. So basically I have three by three. So when I do this, I will break this down into three two by two determinants times the you know unit vector. So the way I do this is like this. So first I look at this in terms of I hat. So I kind of you know cross I hat, you know, both vertical and horizontal, because I'm using you know this I hat. And this basically then gives me what the I hat vector should be multiplied as a two by two. And basically, if I take I hat and then kind of like cross it down, like you know horizontal and vertical, then whatever survives goes into that two by two, which is AY, AZ, BY, BZ. Then minus, in this equation, there is a minus over there. So then I go back to my original matrix and I'm saying, all right, so the second one will be for the J hat. And to do that, then I take J hat and a line, eliminate, you know, vertical and horizontal like that. 
And then what I get here, you can see, right? The only thing surviving is AX, AZ, DX, and DZ, all right? And then plus, and then this is for the K hat, which is again, I go back to my original vector, you know, the matrix. So I take K hat and then eliminate vertical and horizontal, right? Anything vertical to K hat and horizontal to K hat. That means what survives is AX, AY, DX, DY. So I basically break it down to three two by two determinants with then that multiplied by unit vector. And then from here, what I, what I do is basically this. Hopefully you guys remember how to work with determinants, right? So I'm gonna do then, you know, a, a, a y times b z, basically do the cross multiply, right? So a y b z minus a z b y, that's my i hat, then minus same thing here, cross multiply like this. So this a x times b z, then minus a z times b x. This is J hat, then plus same thing for the K hat, right? A X B Y minus A Y B X K hat. So you just basically do that. So that means, you know, this cross product, right? End up being this equals to that, all right? So this is good when you're trying to find specific components or something like that, because this becomes nothing but the, you know, the you can say like, let's say, this becomes the X component of your resultant. This becomes the Y component of your resultant. This becomes the Z component of your resultant, okay? So for example, let's go back and let's do that for the our particular, let's say, you know, cross product in this example. So if I'm doing this for the, let's say two, three, zero, negative one, two, zero. So then let's see what we get. Remember, everything that is Z is zero. So that means this is gonna be zero. This is gonna be zero because all the Z components for each one is zero. So this is zero and this is zero. So the only thing I have surviving here is this, which is AXBY minus AYBX. Let's see what we get from that. You know, if I do it here, so thing like this, AX is two, BY is uh, two, then basically this is four, then minus AY, AY BX. AY is three, BX is negative one, so it becomes negative three. So four minus negative three, then this is seven. And then this coupled with the K hat, seven K hat. That's what we had over there. There you go, you can see, right? You get basically the same thing. Now, which one is easier for you? First method or second method? Up to you. Try to practice a little bit for each, you know, each one and then see which one is easier for you. All right. <clears throat> now, the question is that what does a torque do? So if you remember, right? So I asked you like, let's say, what do we need to make something rotate? And then we said, we have to apply force at some distance D, right? Or distance R, the such that there's, you know, it's effective at rotating. So then what, you know, once you start rotating, so, and you say that it exerts torque, so then what does a torque do? So if you remember for linear motion, the net force causes an object to accelerate. That means non-zero net force causes an object to accelerate. And for a rotation, a net torque causes an object to have an angular acceleration. So we're basically looking at the equivalent equation of this. So let's say the net force divided by the mass is equals to then linear acceleration. So then the net torque divided by equivalent to the mass in the rotating system, which we talked about in part one, which is the moment of inertia, then gives you angular acceleration. That means net torque divided by the moment of inertia is equals to alpha. And alpha then, you know, 
what alpha does is basically, you know, changes your angular velocity. If your angular velocity changes, you mean your speed, you know, the disc or whatever rotating object is speeding up or is it slowing down and things like that. So this is Newton's second law for the rotational motion. Means that there is alpha only when there's a non-zero net torque acting on the object that has a moment of inertia I. Okay, so right in the absence of the net torque, we get a net torque is zero, then object either does not rotate, which is static equilibrium, or rotate with the angular velocity omega is constant, which is then uniform motion. Okay, that means you, you have the uh, static equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium, right? Object either you know does not rotate at all because the, all the net torque cancel, or it basically just moving at constant rate, which omega is constant. Because if this is zero, then alpha is zero, then, you know, for example, omega final equals omega initial plus alpha times T. If this is zero, that means omega doesn't change before and after is always the same. All right, so more or less, this is uh, rotational dynamics. So you can see, right? So we have linear dynamics where you have a net force acting on an object at mass M gives you an acceleration A. And the second law is net force divided by mass. You can then use those three to find the acceleration. Now we have rotational dynamics. Uh, what makes it rotate is the net torque. What kind of prevents it from being rotated or try to, you know, the tendency of the object to try to prevent like the mass here, right? Is the moment of inertia. But as long as there's a non-zero net torque and not an infinitely large, let's say moment of inertia, net torque divided by moment of inertia gives you angular acceleration, okay? So angular acceleration, remember, has a units of radians per second square, right? So, and you know, you can kind of like more or less get those values from the, from this, right? Net torque, remember, net torque is uh, Newtons times meters, more or less. Let me do it like this, right? So Newtons times meters divided by moment of inertia, which has units of kilograms meter square, but Newton is kilograms meter per second square times meters divided by then kilograms times meters. So, um, sorry, meter square. So this meters, this meter becomes meter square. So those cancel with this meter square, kilogram cancels with this kilogram. So you end up with one per second square. But what we do, we just add another radians there to make it, you know, radians per second square. And that's the unit for the angular, you know, acceleration. All right, so technically then what we have is this. The net torque equals alpha times moment of inertia, which is equivalent to the net force equals mass times acceleration. They're all vectors, you know, like this, right? And those are, you know, equivalent to that. That means if in order for you to have angular acceleration, you need to have a net torque, okay? So that's why this is the equation for the, you know, uh, let's say angular in you know, rotational dynamics. But obviously we learned that, you know, what happens when the forces, you know, cancel each other? Well, there is no acceleration and object is in equilibrium. So that means we're gonna be exploring two types of rotational motion. We're gonna look at the rotational dynamics when there is actually, you know, rotation. And we can also look at rotational, you know, equilibrium, you know, static equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium where the system is, you know, either at completely at rest or moving at constant rate. So that's kind of what we have. So we then talk about a rigid object with balanced torque is a rigid object in equilibrium. So this is basically looking at sort of like, let's say Newton's first law for the rotational system. But we have to add something else here because the system now can not only move linearly, but can also rotate. So we have to have two conditions satisfied for us to be in equilibrium, okay? So there has to be no force or no net force but also no net torque. Because for example, think like this, if you have an object like this, so imagine you apply force like that upward, F1. Well, if you apply another force downward, F2, if they have the same magnitude but opposite direction, my net force here is zero, right? One is up, the other one is down. But if I make this object, for example, pivoted at the center, then F1 gives me R1, F2 gives me distance R2 from that. Those actually, with respect to this axial rotation, this gives me counterclockwise torque. This gives me counterclockwise torque. 
So they actually give me non-zero net torque. So even though the net force is zero, this system is gonna start rotating. And obviously, you know, it's not in equilibrium anymore. In order for it to be in equilibrium, I need to also have a net torque to be zero. And in that case, only in that case, then I can have static, you know, complete static equilibrium. That means in a way we have to deal with, you know, uh, two equations uh, because we more or less assume that it's a, you know, two dimensional, uh, you know, let's say force rather than three dimensional. So we have equation one where the net force in the X direction should be equal to zero. Equation two, net force in the Y direction should equal to zero. And equation three, where the net torque, it's a Z, remember, because the torque is perpendicular, right? Always to the force and the distance, the displacement vector. So the net torque should also be zero. All those three should be satisfied in order for us to have a static equilibrium. All right. So more or less, you know, to conceptualize, right? Think about the object that is in equilibrium and identify all the forces acting on it. Imagine what effect each force would have on the rotation of the object if it were the only force acting, right? So for example, if you have a, you know, an object like this, and this is the axis of rotation. See if I apply force right there and it's a line of action going through that axis of rotation, it doesn't do any torque. But, you know, let's say it can actually, you know, push the object upward, right? So you have to look, look at it in terms of, does it, only affect linear motion or the rotational motion or how does it affect, you know, everything else, right? So things like this, if I apply another force here, those two forces can cancel. So there's no linear, you know, force, but they also don't give me torque because, you know, those two forces basically are acting along the, you know, their line of action goes to the axial rotation. I move those two, as I mentioned, right? So see if I move those two forces a little bit to the right, to the left, here's force one, here's force two. The net force is still zero, but now, the system gonna rotate. So just a little bit of here and there, right? Move, moving forces left or right can actually change things dramatically. All right, so confirm that the object under consideration is indeed a rigid object in equilibrium. The object must have a zero translational acceleration and zero angular acceleration. It means both net for equation one, two, three, right? Those three equations, right? Should be satisfied. Draw a diagram and label all external forces acting on the object. So free body diagram becomes very, very important. So if you're still struggling with your free body diagrams, well, you need to go back and really, really, you know, um, nail it down in terms of really understand how to do the free body diagrams. Because even on the exam one, which, uh, you know, I, I saw that some students were really not doing free body diagram at all even, you know, like let's say you, you, you guys calculating everything without doing a single free body diagram. That's kind of, you know, really weird to me, you know, uh, but, you know, let's say um, this is, you know, essential, you know, you, for you to understand free body diagram because in order to do correct, you know, uh, force directions and magnitude and everything, you need to do the free body diagram. All right, so you have to do free body diagram, get the directions and put the tape in a table and organize it. And uh, basically put it in a equation format. And then you have basically three equations, uh, net force in the X direction equals zero, net force in the Y direction equals zero and the net torque external equals zero. Okay. And keeping track of the direction of the forces, torques, positive, negative in order to get the correct you know, answer. All right, so those basically give you some of those things. All right, so here's then what I'm gonna to try to do. So for example, one of the things we're gonna do here is balancing act. So we're gonna you know, also look at some example of that. So this is something that, for example, you can do, right? So you can see that uh, here you have, this is a simulation actually. So you can practice a little bit, for example. So you can do it like this, right? See, right now, if I have something like this, there are now three forces acting in an upward direction from each column and from the pivot point, and there's a gravity acting down. So, for example, if I put it here, put it there, right? Nothing happens because this is a well-balanced, you know, system. Because upward forces are, you know, strong enough that they're going to cancel even these downward forces. But let's see what happens, for example, if I do this. That means the only support is at, you know, at the center. Why? Because that's where the gravity is acting. And now this pivot, right? The support balancing gravity. So the system is in equilibrium. Let's see what happens if I take it and put it there. 
Well, over there now I have more force, the system then starts rotating. Okay. What happens if I put it right here? Well, not right. I guess I, guess I can put it there. Okay. I was gonna put it at the pivot point, but let's say now what happens here is that I take this guy and I put it at two meters. So it goes down. What if I take this one and put it at two meters? It balanced again. Why? Because what I have here is all of my forces are canceling each other. So I have a you know, force from the pivot, right? So there's a force for normal force from the pivot. There is a gravitational force acting on it. And there is then also force, uh, I can say weight one and there is weight two. So in a way, this normal force is strong enough to cancel all of those three weights. But also what I have, there is no rotation because normal force and gravitational force do not do any torque, do not exert any torque. Weight one exerts counterclockwise torque, weight two exerts clockwise torque, torque because they're in the same, same distance and same weight from the, you know, the axis of rotation, which is here, their torques also cancel each other and the system in equilibrium, all right? So then, for example, if I take this guy and move it a little bit here, right? See, then it doesn't work, right? So you still have a system that is basically, you know, going to be rotating counterclockwise because weight one gives you greater torque. Okay, but obviously, you know, if I make this one heavier, or this side, right, I'm adding another thing. So everything. So you can see like more or less, you can also look at in terms of those. All right, so I'll put this simulation so you guys can, you know, play with that. Uh, and there, there are other ones too. So let's say you can look at, you know, in terms of um, let's say children and things like that. So let's see. So you can put the 60 kilogram person over there and then 30 kilograms person over there. So see if you put it the same distance, you know, obviously the heavier person actually, you know, wins, right? But here's the thing. If I move the, this person further and, uh, you know, this person closer, you can actually find the balance. Okay, you can find the balance. Why? Because what we have here is, so this is, let's say, uh, you know, D1. This is, you know, M1, person one, which gives us weight one. And this person gives us weight two. And this is D2. So what I'm doing here is the net torque is equals to torque one, which is positive minus torque two, which is negative, right? So this is weight one, D1 minus weight two, D2. So that means even though person one is half the weight, person one also twice the distance, right? So that compensates. So let's say, you know, uh, I can say like, let's say this is 30 times 10 or so roughly, 300 newtons times two minus, this is roughly 600 newtons times uh, 0.5, right? Oh, sorry, not 0.5, but like one. So I'm gonna get then zero because, you know, they cancel each other. So that's, you know, some of the things you can do kind of play around and, um, you know, work with this and see that you can, you know, find this, this balance, all right? So then let's look at then an example here, which is basically a similar example, which you can you know, even play with that in, 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 the, in the previous slide. So here's then what we have. So we have a board of mass M, which is two kilograms, serve as a seesaw for two children. Child A has a mass of 30 kilograms and sits 2.5 meter from the pivot point, uh, which is, you know, let's call it P. His center of gravity is 2.5 meter from the pivot. At what distance X from the pivot must child B of mass 25 kilogram place herself to balance the seesaw? Assume the board is uniform and centered over the pivot. All right. So then what we have here is we have free body diagram. So you can see, right? So this is free body diagram of the board. Because what we want to look at here is we want the board to be balanced. So the board is our object of interest. So board has all the mass concentrated at the center because it's, you know, it's, you know, uniform where the gravity is acting on it. But there's a support, right? That gives us a normal force. 
Well, those two, since they go through the axis of rotation, they don't exert any torque. But then you have the person, you know, child A, right? So which the force acting is equals to, you know, his weight, 2.5 meters from the, you know, uh, from the axis of rotation perpendicular. So he does exert torque. And we have child B somewhere, right? Says that, you know, the, 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 the weight that she uses to exert torque, right? Which is also perpendicular to the distance X, right? So theta is also 90 degrees. Uh, we wanna find basically what, you know, how far away should she be, right? So that the system is in equilibrium. All right, so in a way I can, I have this. Here's net torque. So it's torque due to the normal force plus torque due to the gravity plus torque due to the weight one plus torque due to the weight two equals zero. Because if I want the system to be in equilibrium, normal force doesn't do any torque. Why? Again, because it's going through the axis of rotation. Gravitational force, same reason, no torque. But other two, they do exert torque. So then I can say that, you know, this becomes weight one times, you know, um, D1. Uh, since the, the child A gives you counterclockwise, so it's positive, then minus weight two times X equals zero. That means weight two times X equals weight one times D1, which gives my M1 G X equals M2 G D1. I can cancel the Gs, right? And then X is equals to M2 over M1 D1. And I can calculate the X, which will be uh, M2 here is 30 kilograms divided by 25 kilo, no, other way around. Two or one, A or B, same thing. So, so this is 25 and this is 30, sorry. And then times 2.5 meters, okay. And if we do that, we should that get the distance for the child, but then this should be three meters. Right, so this should be three meters. Okay. That means if she sits, even though she's lighter, right? If she sits further, a little bit further away, right? The, the system can be still balanced. All right. So let's look at another one. In this example, we have 120 centimeter wide sign and it's from a five kilogram, 200 centimeter long pole. So here's the sign, physics shop, right? And it is five kilogram. No, so it, it is, um, it hangs from a five kilogram, 200 centimeter long pole. Um, a cable of negligible mass supports the end of the rod as shown. That means you can see then uh, basically you have a, a sign that, you know, hangs from a pole and there's also a cable, you know, connected to the pole, right? At that point. And um, what we want to know is this, what is the maximum mass of the sign if the maximum tension in the cable without breaking is 300 Newtons. That means, let's say if I have the sign connected to the pole at two points, one is 80 centimeter from the left side, the other one is at the end, let's take it at the end, right? So what should be then the mass of the sign so that the system is still in equilibrium, All right? So now, one of the first thing you wanna do is that you wanna um, identify what's your object of interest, which, which, which object you basically take as the object of interest and do all the free body diagram for. And this sometimes, you know, students struggle with this. And in this case is actually, the pole, because remember the pole is in equilibrium and you have a sign hanging from one end, there's a tension, you know, and there's also the support and thing like that from the wall. And what we have here is in this particular case, what we're doing, we're saying that the system is in equilibrium when let's say the, the, the cable, which is 300 Newtons holding it in a, you know, let's say upward direction. And then the sign is, you know, basically exerting force downward, but if, let's say sine has certain mass M, then the system still will be in equilibrium. So here's the free body diagram for that. And let's see, let's, let's look at free body diagram. So pole, again, the pole itself, right, is our object of interest. We are told that pole has um, 200 centimeter length, right? And it's five kilograms. 
So the mass of the pole is five kilogram in its length is 500 centimeters. Now, we are told that the pole itself is just basically uh, pretty much a rod, uniform rod. And you can think of like, let's say the mass is since it's uniform, right? Mass is concentrated at the center at this point, 100 centimeters, right? From the, from the, from the wall. And the gravity, when it's acting on the pole, acting exactly at that position. So this, that's where the gravity acting on the pole. Then there's also a, a cable. Cable acting at the, you know, at this point. So taking this to be zero, this to be 200 centimeters, right? Or let's say two meters. So then the, the tension, the cable acting at exactly two meters. Now, here's 51.3 degrees. How do we get that 51.3 degrees? Well, we are told that this distance is 2.250 centimeters and this one is 200 centimeters. So then I can actually find the you know, angle, you know, feed that let's say the, the cable makes with, you know, um, with the pole, which is, you know, nothing but doing the tangent of theta, right? Tangent of theta is equals to uh, Y over X. So Y is 250, X is 200. You know, using inverse tangent, we should get 51.3 degrees. So this should be no problem for you guys. Okay, because we need that. We need to know that information. All right, so now let's do this. Um, there's also a sign and sign is acting at two different places, right? One is right here, which is 80 centimeters from the pole. That means, you know, th this is one position that the, the sign is acting at. Because what it does, because it's, it has two cables connected to the pole, its weight is distributed to those two, two, two tensions. So here's one point where it's acting. Here's another point. So the weight of the sign is distributed to those two, you know, uh, let's say to, to those two tensions in a way. That means it's, it's acting at two different places, right? So each one then gives you half of the weight of the sign. Okay, so that's why if, if, I, if I have the sign connected to the pole with one tension, then it's pulling down on the pole with all of its weight. I connected it with two cables. It's actually, you know, only pulling down two different places, but only half of its weight. So kind of like, kind of like this, okay? So there's also two other forces that are not pictured, but those forces are, are like this. So there's a force from this wall, okay? One is gonna be here toward this, this is normal force. So from the wall, and there's actually another one like that, which is the friction, static friction, which is like that, all right? So that's kind of what I have. So then think like this, if I'm doing my force table, So if I have my force table, so this is an X component, Y component. So here's what I have. So I have a tension. Then I have normal force and static friction. Then I have, uh, let's say, let me put it like this, weight of the pole, right? And then weight of the sine one and weight of the sine two, kind of like this. All right, so then I kind of go like this, right? Tension, uh, basically acting such that, um, so you can see like that, right? So the tension has uh, components, right? So it's negative T cosine 53, because if I break it down, in it's X component will be like that, right? So this will be TX and then T sine of 53. So that's the Y component. Normal force acting in a positive X direction in this case, right? To the right, and it has no Y component. Static friction acting in a positive X direction, a positive Y direction, and there's no X component. Weight of the pole, which is acting down. So this is minus mass of the pole times G. So basically, you know, you know let me write that down. Well, let me, let, let me do it like this. It's minus weight of the pole and then then I can say minus one half weight of the sine and then minus one half weight of the sine for the second one. Okay. That means I get, you know, things like this. I get two equations from here. Equation one is this. 
So even away, normal force minus T cosine 53. So what is it equals to? Remember, we, we assume that this is hangs, right? So it's static equilibrium, so this is zero. Equation two. So what do we get? So we have T sine of 53 plus F of S minus weight of the pole minus one half weight of the sine minus one half weight of the sine equals zero. So I get those two equations. Remember, my goal here is to find the weight of the pole, right? So, or mass of the pole. And this is in equation two. But I have tons of unknowns over there. I don't know what's the uh, static friction there. And, um, and I don't know, let's say the, the, the weight of the sign, right? So I have two unknowns. And equation one doesn't necessarily give me, you know, uh, let's say the value of static friction. So I'm kind of stuck with equation one. But remember, I also have another equation, which is equation three, which is then a net torque equals zero. Okay, I also remember that's, thing, that's the good thing about this, you know, static equilibrium that also includes rotation, net torque equals zero. That means this equation three gives me this, torque due to normal force plus torque due to static friction plus torque due to the weight of the sign, weight of the pole plus torque due to weight of the sine one, plus torque due to weight of the sine two, plus torque due to the tension equals zero. And don't, don't be scared because we have so many terms. So, but this is basically due to tor torque due to, you know, possibly due to each force. So let's see what we get. In this particular example, remember the, st the system is in static equilibrium, not rotating at all. So, and remember every torque has to be taken its distance with respect to the axis of rotation. But now the question that, okay, so which one is my axis of rotation? Because, you know, it's not rotating. Well, that's the beauty of that. Because we don't have a, you know, some kind of specific given axis of rotation, because it's not rotating, you can choose any point you want as an axis of rotation. All right, so you can have any point you want as axis of rotation. And the point here is you can choose any point. I can choose this point. I can choose that point. I can choose this point, or I can choose this point, any point I want. Do I wanna choose this point? Absolutely not. Because if I choose this point, that means every force exerts torque with respect to that point. And I don't want that. But here's the thing. If I go and I, if I choose this point as axis of rotation, remember what I said, right? If you do line of action of any force, and if they go through the axis of rotation, they exert no torque. See, I have no information about static friction or normal force. And I don't need to right now because if I choose that point to be the axis of rotation, which is that, you know, the, the, uh, the support point with the wall, then that point becomes the axis of rotation, then no, normal force and the static friction exert no torque. That means I already canceled two of those. The rest, I actually can work together, okay? I can work with the other two because what I, other, other four, because what I have here is this, taking the, you know, the, the left, basically the wall to be the axis of rotation, then torque due to the weight of the pole is basically the weight of the pole times distance to the, you know, DP, right? Which is basically uh, the position of where the gravity acting on the pole, which is basically hundred centimeters or one meter. So I have that and it's perpendicular. So, that means, you know, sine is 90 degrees. And this guy is gonna give me negative torque because it's gonna make the system go counterclockwise, sorry, go clockwise. So it's negative torque. So this is with this one, this. How about this one, weight of the sine one, which is let's say this point over here. Well, I know that this point is 80 centimeters from the wall. So, and it's, you know, also counterclockwise. So negative, basically one half weight of the sine times 0.8. It's also, you know, perpendicular, so it's 90 degrees. How about this guy? Well, it's one half weight of the sine times how far away it's acting, and it's acting two meters away. Well, how about this one over here? Well, this is the only torque that gives me positive rotation counterclockwise, so plus, so magnitude, which is tension, and I'm given that, then times distance, which is basically two meters, acting two meters from the wall, and then, you know, 
51.3 degrees, the angle it makes with the radial line. So it's sine of 53, 51.3. And this is equals to zero. The whole thing equals to zero, right? Then I can calculate because this is minus, well, weight of the pole is five kilograms times 9.8, then times one meters minus then one half, then mass of the sine times 9.8 times 0.8, then minus one half, uh, mass of the sine times 9.8 times two meters, then plus 300 times two meters for the tension, right? Then sine of 51.3 degrees, this whole thing equals zero. The only thing I don't know is the mass of the sine. Just rearrange, calculate. We're gonna get mass of the sine to be 31 kilograms. So if you rearrange and calculate, we can say that mass of the sine has to be no more than 31 kilograms in order for the system to be in static equilibrium. All right, so again, hopefully you guys are able to you know, follow. If not, again, feel free to rewatch this part again. Okay, so that was an example of, you know, a couple of examples of static equilibrium. But what happens if then the, there is no static equilibrium? That means the net external torque is not zero. Well, in that case, you get angular acceleration. That means your system now is able to rotate and in such a way that there's an angular acceleration, which means it's gonna start, you know, uh, speeding up or slowing down. So we can look at some examples of that. All right, let's see what we have here. So a 2.5 kilogram, 11 centimeter radius cylinder, initially at rest, is free to rotate about the axis of cylinder. A rope of negligible mass is wrapped around it and pulled with the force, uh, with the force of, sorry here, 17 Newtons. Okay. Assuming that the rope does not slip, find the net torque exerted on the cylinder by the rope the angular acceleration of the cylinder and the angular speed of the cylinder after 0.5 seconds. All right, so let's assume here's my cylinder, which is you can think of as a, as a disc, right? And here's the rotation, you know, let's say axis of rotation. Let's say there's a, like a, you know, a rope wrapped around like that, or, you know, let's make it on this side. So make everything, let's say positive. All right, so think like this. you have the rope and you're just pulling the rope. And when you pull the rope, then it exerts a, you know, a force, which is basically the tension, right? Exactly radius distance away from that. So as soon as you pull it down, then it exerts torque, right? So then part A is what is the, um, what is the torque? Well, torque is equals to you know, R times F times sine of theta, remember? So R is the radius, force is the tension and you know, theta is 90 degrees because, you know, the tension is acting perpendicular to the, this radial line. All right, so then this becomes, you know, 11 centimeter radius, which is 0.11 meters, then times the 10, you know, the tension, which is 17 Newtons. So you can calculate that together, get 1.9 Newtons times meters. All right, so that's the torque. Well, it's a non-zero torque. So what it will do, it will basically make it accelerate and alpha equals net torque divided by the moment of inertia. Net torque is 1.9 Newtons times meters. What is that moment of inertia? Well, there's a table, right? That I gave you last in the last class, last, you know, the, the, the part where the moment of inertia for a disc is always one half M times radius square. That's basically for always for the moment of inertia of a disc. We can also use that for the pulley. So it's one half times its mass, which is 2.5 kilograms times the radius, which is 0.11 meter squared. And if we calculate that, we should begin able to get the net torque. So this, uh, sorry, the angular acceleration. So 1.2 times 10 to the two radians per second square. All right, so now that means, you know, it starts accelerating from that. Uh, I remember initially at rest, so I can say then, you know, angular velocity omega initially is zero. 
So then the question is that, what is the angular speed of the cylinder after 0.5 seconds? Now that I know it starts from rest and accelerates at that rate, then I can use the angular, uh, you know, assuming that angular acceleration is kinematics, I can, uh, uh, sorry, angular acceleration is constant. I can use those kinematic equations. Omega final equals omega initial plus alpha T. So zero plus 1.2 times 10 to the two uh, radians per second square, then times 0.5 seconds. Calculate omega final to be then 62 radians per second. And that's my final speed after half a second. All right, so you can see, right? So we combined rotational dynamics with rotational kinematics, just like we would have, you know, combined um, linear dynamics with linear kinematics. All right, so here's an example. You, hopefully you guys remember this. Is. We looked at this before, which is Atwood machine. And now there's a big difference because we're gonna consider the system that's shown. We have a mass of 20 kilograms, mass one, 20 kilograms, mass two is 12.5 kilogram. Then there's a pulley that has a radius of 0.2 meters and has a mass of five kilogram. So object M2 is resting on the floor and object M1 is four meter above the floor when it is released from rest. The pulley axis is frictionless. The cord is light, does not stretch and does not slip on the pulley. Calculate the time interval required for M1 to hit the floor. And how would you answer, how would your answer change if the pulley were massless? All right, so and that's actually a very important thing. We did this example in previous chapters, but we always assume that mass of the you know rope is massless, or you can say the rope is massless plus the pulley was massless. And when the pulley was massless, that meant it did not provide any moment of inertia or any inertia to the motion. So it was not part of the equations, not part of the you know calculations. But now it has a size, radius, and mass. That means what happens here is this. So think like this. So if this is the you know the disc right, which is a pulley. If you have one rope and another rope like that, so let's say this is your T1, this is T2. Remember before we said that T1 was equals to T2 for those you know two interacting objects. So we can't say that anymore. So this is no longer can be true. Why? Well, because think like this. If you have a you know a disc like that and you have tension one, tension two. If both are exactly the same and acting exactly the same distance from the axis of rotation, but one is counterclockwise, the other one is clockwise, and that means they, they give you exactly same torque but opposite directions, so the net torque will be what? Will be zero, right? So that means if you're doing, like, say, T1 times R minus uh, T2 times R, you will get zero if T1 and T2 are the same. Well, if the T1 and T2 are the same, that means disk is not rotating. So your system just stays there, but it's not the case, right? Because now if that pulley has mass and size, we assume that the system goes down because the pulley is rotating. So T1 and T2 no longer can be the same. And that's now one of the important things that we are changing. So this does not apply anymore. Another thing we had was that acceleration of one and acceleration two were the same. Let's see, is this still true? Well, yes, this is still true. Plus now we have object three, right? Which is the pulley. So then I can say this is also equal to the same acceleration as the pulley. Same linear acceleration as the pulley, tangential linear acceleration of the pulley. So this is true, but tension no longer the same. So this, this is no longer true. So try to remember this. Whenever your pulley has a mass and size, right? And you're talking about, let's say a problem from this chapter, tension in the, in the string, right? Even though you know it's massless, tension is not the same anymore. Simply because the pulley will not rotate if the tensions are the same. All right, then in a way, what we can do here is this. So mathematics, most, most part is exactly the same for those blocks moving in a linear direction. So I will just, you know, divide this into three systems, system one, system two, and now a system three, okay? So system one and two equations are exactly the same. So let's, let's look at system one. Here's mass one and here's a string. So there is weight one and there is tension one. 
Okay. So um, I'm going to make it a little bit simpler. So skip the force table, but you know, I always encourage you guys to do the force table. But here, um, what I'm going to do is this. I get equation one from here, which is weight one minus tension one equals and mass one times acceleration one. This is the black one because black one is heavier, right? It's going to you know, go down. So I take them down as positive direction. For system two, here's black two, here's tension two, and here's weight two. Well, for this one, it's actually going to speed upward. So I take up as positive. So equation two will be T2 minus weight two equals M2 times acceleration two. Now, finally, I have system three, which is something new. So the system three is basically the disc where I have then tension one and tension two acting. So they're both acting same distance from the axis of rotation, right? Which is the same radius distance. So this gives me equation three. Let me kind of do it here. Well, actually let me do that here and then I will move it over here. So here's equation three. Equation three will be this net torque equals torque one minus torque two, because torque one gonna be counterclockwise, torque two clockwise. And this is equals to I times alpha, because this is net torque equals I times alpha. Now, what is torque one? Well, it's T1 times R. What is torque two? Is T2 times R. How about I times alpha? Well, I is the moment of inertia of the disc. So it's one half M3 times R square and alpha, remember alpha is what? Alpha is equals to, if I rearrange this, right? So it becomes acceleration divided by the R, right? Remember A, A equals R times alpha. So alpha equals A over R. So I can write this as A equals A over R because this is A3. And then from here, you can see this. I can factor out So I can factor out R, so it becomes T1 minus T2, and this equals two. And then here, this R will cancel that R over there. So this becomes one half M3 times R times A3. And then even here, then R can cancels out. And my equation three becomes this, T1 minus T2 equals one half M3 times A3. All right, so that's my equation three. So then I can come back in and write this equation three. T1 minus T2 equals one half. M3, A3. All right, so now we get three equations instead of two, okay? So for the Atwood machine, we get three equations because now I have another system, which is the uh, pulley. Again, what can I ask you here? Well, I can ask you two things or three things, mass one, mass two, mass three right now, right? So I can have that. So things like variables are mass one, mass two, mass three, but there's also tension one and tension two, which are not the same anymore, but acceleration of the system is the same. So I can actually replace it with just A. So now think like this, those are my variables, M1, M2, M3, T1, T2, and A. And you have three equations. So it, it, it's, you know, a lot of times you're going to be, you know, let's say doing rearrangements and things like that. But here's the thing. If I give you M1, M2, and M3, and, you know, that should be enough because then you're going to have three unknowns and three equations. No problem at all. So what you do here, you first add all three equations together. You add those. If you do that, this T1 cancels with that T1. This T2 cancels with that T2. And the result is weight one minus weight two equals then acceleration then times M1 plus M2 plus one half M3. And then you solve for acceleration, which will be then M1G minus M2G and divided by M1 plus M2 plus one half M3. You can see, right? So you can calculate that. So let's say something like that. And we need that, right? We need that because for example, remember we wanna know how long does it take for it to go from this point A to this point B. 
And if I want to know that, I need to know the acceleration. So for this particular example, I don't need any tension. I just need to acceleration. And I am given, right? M1, M2, and M3. Just plug in that equation and solve for acceleration. You know, which I should get as 2.1 meter per second square. There you go. All right, so once I get that, once I get that, then the other one is, you know, part B is no big deal because part B is saying, okay, so the system M1 starts, from, you know, the object or system starts from rest and it goes down, right? Uh, a four meter distance. So let's say this Delta Y equals four meters and I'm given that. And I know that acceleration. So basically I know initial velocity is zero acceleration 2.1 meter per second and it undergoes uh, basically four meter displacement. All I have to do is just use this equation two delta y equals one half a t squared since the initial is zero. All right, so all I have to do is just calculate for t by rearranging everything, right? So square root of two times delta y over a, and I can solve for t to be 1.95 seconds. There we go. So that's part a which is I needed to find acceleration using Newtonian dynamics and rotational dynamics, and then find the time. Because once the object going down, it's just a linear motion. So I can use linear kinematics for that. Okay, so then part B says, how would your answer change if the pulley were massless? Well, if the pulley were massless, then I would not have this you know, part system three, right? Part three. And acceleration will be just in terms of those two equations. So, which is, I think, you know, will be, would have been, you know, uh, weight one minus weight two. Uh, so let's say in this case, this would not have been part of the you know, equation. So my acceleration would have been a little bit higher and then my time would have been a little bit, you know, uh, shorter. Okay, so you can try to do that on your own, but that's kind of like more conceptual. What happens there? Then my system basically doesn't have a rotation. T1 equals the same, T1 equals T2. So then I don't have this third equation. All right, the kinetic energy for the rotating system, which we saw last in the last part, so rotational kinetic energy, basically told us that there, you know, there is a, you know, energy approach, you know, to this as well. That means you can look at it in terms of energy, and you can think like, let's say, when you do a, when you apply force, and force makes the object to move, which basically rotate, right? So remember, F times delta S or F times DS. So F is F sine phi times DS is RT theta. In a way we can say that, you know, work done can be also represented in terms of the, the torque and the angular displacement rather than force and the linear displacement. And that's the equation, you know, DW equals torque times D theta. So in a way work done here is equals to torques times delta theta. If the torque is constant, right? If it's not constant, then you can pretty much, you know, put it in an integral, right? And integrate. But this is if the torque is constant, okay. If it's not constant, then it becomes basically work done equals integral of torque dt between t initial, theta initial, theta final. And you basically, you know, here's one important thing about the integral. So torque d theta, which is equal to work done, becomes i omega d omega. So kind of like you can replace it with that. Okay, so um, you can replace it with that because you know, because the theta is alpha, you know, alpha is the omega d theta, right? All of those things. So you can kind of rearrange it from here. So for example, on the left side, right? So things like this. So the torque is then I times alpha, then d theta, then I times alpha becomes the omega dt, then d theta. And then we rearrange those two, d theta dt, is nothing but omega, so it becomes I omega D omega, okay? So that means you replace this I omega D omega, and then the work done is basically, if you integrate that, becomes one half I omega final square minus one half I omega initial square, which again becomes changing rotational kinetic energy, which is the same mathematical form as the work kinetic energy theorem for the translational systems, okay? So, so in a way you can see that if the work done is 
torque times, you know, in a way, uh, the theta, right? Or the, 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 uh, the, you know, the derivative of that will then give me, you know, um, the derivative of the work done, remember, is the power. And this will be then torque, ta torque times, you know, uh, angular velocity. So power is equal to torque times then angular velocity, okay? Which is again, kind of similar to force times linear velocity. So remember, torque is equivalent, analogous to the force, omega is analogous to the linear velocity. So most of the equations are pretty much same format. You just replace with the angular variables. All right, so that's it for the part two.